This meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. Um, again, thank you for joining us. If I can um, please just remind everyone, or for the people who have just joined us, if you have any questions for our um, speakers, please add them to the chat. And then this afternoon at uh, 3.45, we have a panel discussion with all of our speakers regarding the value of certification audits. Um, it's quite a wide topic, but if you've got any questions that you'd like to propose to the panel regarding the value and um, uh, different ways of looking at the value of certification audits and using them, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Please add that to the chat as well. Um, our next speaker is Marion Bray. I'm, I'm very happy to uh, introduce Marion Bray to everyone. A number of you would already know Marion Bray. Marion's worked across the food industry for manufacturing, auditing, um, retail, and Marion is the Food Safety and Quality Manager for 7-Eleven Australia. Uh, Marion will be talking about the challenges in food safety and supply management. So I'd like to welcome Marion. Thank you. Good afternoon, evening, morning, everybody. Um, thank you to SQFI for asking me to speak to everyone today. It's um, greatly appreciated. My name is Marion, as Damien just mentioned. I've been in the Australian food industry for Harumph, harumph years. Um, I'm currently the Food Safety and Quality Manager for the Food Strategy Squad for 7-Eleven Australia. And as usual, I have a lot to say. So if I'm talking too fast, please let me know. So just quickly, um, I will be speaking about food safety and supply management challenges. But I thought I would give you some background on 7-Eleven um, Australia. 7-Eleven <clears throat> uh, first opened their first store in 1976 when the Withers and Barlow families signed the licence agreement to bring the 7-Eleven brand to Australia. Um, the first store opened in Oakley in Victoria and it literally did trade from just 7 until 11. Um, it wasn't long after 1978 that the first 24 hour open store was opened up. And that was quite shocking because it wasn't until 1992 that stores were able to be open past midnight, I think, on a Thursday night, and they weren't actually allowed to trade on a Sunday at all. So here we are 46 years later. And 7-Eleven Australia have over 764 active locations. And I say locations because not all of them are bricks and mortar shops as you would know them. 65% um, of these are franchise owned stores and the rest of them are corporate owned stores. We have more than 9,000 employees under the 7-Eleven Australian banner. And the majority of these stores are actually open uh, 24 hours a day. So some of these new concepts are, of course, our standard stores with uh, fuel or petrol station services. We have our CBD stores. We have our Johnny's Deli concept stores, which sell heated to order hot deli sandwiches. We also have our micro format stores, which are self-service stores embedded inside office buildings. And we even have some vending machines located in some halls of residence at a couple of universities. Uh, we also have uh, home delivery services and a lot of our stores, particularly these uh, micro format or vending machine stores, operate with a cashless and cardless app system. So you think you've got problems writing a food safety plan, try writing a food safety plan that includes a chilled vending machine with short shelf life product that's in a university hall of residence. Bit of a challenge, I can tell you. 
So here's some photos of the various concepts that we, we currently have out there or various formats of stores. And I can tell you those Johnny's Deli sandwiches are absolutely delish. So in addition to all of these different store formats, and along with most retailers and manufacturers in the world, 7-Eleven also has many corporate social responsibility programs, such as Cup Rescue, which has so far diverted over 6 million coffee and sloopy cups from landfill since its inception. And we also support various charity groups, such as AIMS, Salvation Army, Second Bite and Food Bank. And um, it goes without saying that we also uh, follow some various ethical sourcing programs. We have animal welfare programs. We have fair trade with our delicious 7-Eleven freshly ground coffee. And all of these initiatives need to be included into our store food safety plan and our supplier approval programs. But none of these store formats or product and corporate social responsibility initiatives are possible without robust food safety plans, supplier management program, and support from our learning and development teams to keep staff trained and our operations teams to keep stores running smoothly. So <clears throat> moving right along and with apologies to Jane Austen. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a food manufacturing company in possession of a food safety program must be in want of the cheapest possible solution. We all know that QA and food safety is viewed by most businesses as a necessary evil. It's seen as a cost rather than a benefit. So I'm going to briefly talk about some of the common challenges that we in the food safety side of the food industry we all face every day and hopefully to give you some useful tips on how to overcome these challenges because a trouble shared is a trouble halved. So to start off with some of the common key challenges as I see them are management support and commitment, resources which is dollars, staffing and time, inexperience and complacency. So it seems that every food safety or quality standard in the world now includes some elements on management commitment. And why is that? It's because we know, we all know that in the world of manufacturing, in a lot of instances, unless management commitment is raised as a requirement of a standard and with a potential non-conformance attached to it, management are quite likely just to pay lip service to the cost of food safety and to leave it as a QA manager's problem. And without strong commitment from senior levels in your business, obtaining the required resources and overcoming other food safety challenges is going to be an uphill battle. So the challenges of obtaining appropriate levels of management commitment and resources are interlinked. Food safety culture starts from the top. If the managing director walks through the production area without washing his or her hands or without wearing the correct PPE, why should your general floor team feel I have to? And comments such as it's just food safety or that's a QA problem, reinforce that food safety is a low priority for your business. Management support and commitment is more than just a signed policy or statement hanging in a frame in the reception area. It's ongoing participation in and support of all business, all aspects of your business's food safety and quality activities, policies and procedures. And of course, one of the major challenges of management commitment is to obtain resources that will support your food safety and quality program. Resources is money obviously, plus staff and the most precious resource, time. Dollars equals proper equipment, which is well-maintained, proper staffing levels, investment in product development, investment in testing, investment in training, all of which are fairly easy to quantify. But the cost of getting it wrong, that's much more difficult to calculate. The cost of getting it wrong could be anything from the death of a consumer, 
through to permanent injury, to fines, financial penalties for the business, loss of brand or business reputation, and on the costs of retrieval or disposal of affected stock, or even the cost imposed by retailers for actioning recalls. To try and put some value around this, in 2022, there were 66 public recalls for food or beverage products in Australia. And goodness knows how many product withdrawals on top of that, because those withdrawals don't need to be notified to regulatory authorities or the public. My review of the 2022 Fizan's recall register shows that 25 recalls, which were for 45 SKUs across multiple date codes, were all affected by undeclared allergens alone. And although I'm making some assumptions, that allergen issue by itself means that 68% of all recalls in Australia last year were most likely preventable by having a robust allergen management program and labelling verification systems in place, both of which are key components of a manufacturer's food safety program. As most major retailers are charged a handling fee per SKU per store, that recall would have cost approximately five, over $5.5 million just to remove those SKUs from the retail outlets, plus the additional costs of dumping affected products, packaging or relabeling, if that was possible, and the costs of mandatory advertising in papers, social media, radio, et cetera, plus increased potential increased insurance fees and the almost unmeasurable loss of brand reputation. As the old saying goes, prevention is better than cure. Moving on to some more resourcing challenges with that everybody is familiar with. Staffing is more than just having enough staff to cover production shifts. It's about, do you have the right people doing the right roles? Are staff trained and encouraged to continue their professional development? Do the staff facilities provided by your business meet their needs? For example, staff lockers, lunching rooms, parking, et cetera. Or do your production and warehouse staff not feel valued because of these poor facilities and so their motivation to do the right thing is low? And of course, during COVID times, actually finding a stable factory team and more importantly, keeping that team healthy created its own challenges. Another resource which is overlooked is time. Time cannot be bought. It cannot be replaced or repaired. So budgeting and allocating time needs to be a priority as it's key to meeting your food safety program requirements. Time to conduct CCP activities correctly. Time to document records and conduct verification activities. Time to properly clean equipment and the, and the environment. We also need to factor in time for production teams to change into and out of uniforms and PPE. When production or management is focused on production output, meeting order dispatch deadlines and keeping payroll costs down, it can become extremely challenging to schedule enough time to support your food safety processes. Production and scheduling needs to allow for allergen control, line clearance between products for products and packaging and for proper staff breaks. Cleaning scheduling needs to allow for enough time for proper cleaning between products, between breaks, between shifts, and to allow for routine deep cleaning on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarter, quarterly, or even annual basis. Not allowing sufficient time for your team to conduct their job or role activities effectively is a major cause of failures in a food safety program. Other key challenges which all manufacturing sites face are inexperience and complacency. And strangely enough, they are closely tied together. A new business, a new factory, a new production line or a new process will always have hidden issues that only show themselves after the plant or line has been operating for a while. In addition to this, a new or an inexperienced staff will take some time to learn the policies, procedures, and the ins and outs of their new job. Under the heading of complacency, how many times have we all heard this? We've always done it this way. It's often difficult for those of us charged with the food safety program to take a step back 
even when conducting scheduled reviews and verification activities. So just because nothing has gone wrong so far doesn't mean that everything is perfect. Inexperience and complacency within a food manufacturing business can be symbiotic and self-perpetuating problem. Lack of experience with a process and lack of experience with how other facilities of a similar nature are operating can create an environment of complacency. How do you know that there isn't a better way to manage a potentially hazardous process if you've never seen, experienced, or been exposed to other ways of working? How do you know that what your site is doing actually is best practice? If you've never experienced anything other than your own factory floor, how do you know that there isn't a safer or more efficient way to run your production line? You don't know what you don't know. Complacency is a lack of time or a lack of motivation to look at new methodology or practices. And remember that just because there hasn't been a problem yet, it doesn't mean you haven't got a problem in your food safety plan. So here are a few prompts on how to manage some of these challenges. With management commitment, in the past, I've had some success with improving a business's food safety culture and obtaining some very hard to come by management support by having a two days on the line program where office space management staff spent two days every year actually working side by side with the production teams on the factory floor. I highly recommend it, even if it's just for the photo opportunities. If two days isn't possible, then do a single day or even a half day. Anything to get the powers that be off their pedestals in the office and into the real world of the factory floor to experience how things actually run and what the production floor and warehouse teams are facing. It's been my experience that nothing will fast track an upgrade to a piece of equipment or give more time to a cleaning schedule, quite like having the MD to pull apart a conveyor belt, clean it, and then reassemble it within 20 minutes. One of the most important things I could also share with you is that language matters. Quality sounds like a nice to have and downplays the seriousness of what we do. If your role or job title is QA manager, change it to food safety and quality manager. If your team or department is the quality team, change it to the food safety and quality team. If this isn't possible, then when at least when you do a toolbox talk on a production floor, make it the food safety toolbox talk or not the daily food toolbox talk. When you submit a weekly, daily or quarterly report to senior management, change the title of that report to the food safety and quality whatever report. But if you can't make changes to role titles, department titles or report titles, at least make sure you use the words food safety every time you speak to production and warehouse staff or your site colleagues and peers and site management. The more you can remind your business that food safety is your priority, the more the business will start to treat food safety as their priority. I cannot say it enough, language matters. Take whatever opportunity you can to remind your senior management team that not only is the business as a whole, but we as individuals have a moral responsibility to customers and consumers. And that in Australia, although I'm not sure about other Oceania countries, individuals in management roles, company directors and even board members can be held legally liable, and sometimes that means criminally liable, for failures in food safety. If a manager or owner of business blatantly does not provide sufficient resources and support, or actually gives instructions to take shortcuts, on top of fines to the business, they can end up being fined as an individual. In extreme cases, they may even face prosecution. Luciano and Philip Markey, the owners of the now infamous Garibaldi Small Goods Company in South Australia, originally faced manslaughter charges in 1997, but these were later dropped in exchange for a guilty plea to the lesser criminal offence of creating risk of harm. 
So when it comes to resources, ensure you have appropriate staffing levels in line with the nature of the processes and the volume of the products being manufactured. And part of this is to do what is whatever is within your power to retain staff. Their knowledge and experience with your equipment, your processes and products is invaluable. Invest in training, invest in retraining. And again, if you're able to get office-based senior management actually working on the factory floor, you may find that getting some of those extra dollars for resources becomes a little bit easier. Another resourcing issue is that many food safety and QA managers often wear multiple hats, especially if you're in a small or medium-sized business. You may find yourself being in the QA slash production slash health and safety slash HR slash purchasing manager. And while this isn't ideal and may not be avoidable, try to limit the, limit the amount of dual roles and try to prioritise the full food safety elements and the OCH health and safety elements over any of the other hats you wear. If possible, outsource those other roles, such as HR, to an external service provider. But if you're in such a small or medium-sized business that it's not possible to use an external resource, please try and stand your ground and remind the management team that your specialist area is food safety. Remind them that the business is reliant on you to be the guardian of food safety and that all those other roles will take a back seat to that priority. So other challenges are inexperience. The only way to cure inexperience is to be open to new experiences. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Unfortunately, when working in a food manufacturing site, opportunity to see other facilities and share knowledge and experience can be very limited. I suggest you treat your second and third party audits as an opportunity to learn and grow. You have the benefit of basically a subject matter expert coming into your facility with fresh eyes to help you identify potential problems. A good auditor will be your eyes and ears and a sense check of your systems. So try not to take non-conformances personally, as difficult as that is. So while third-party auditors are not in a position to provide guidance or instruction, depending on the owners of the standards they're auditing and the various code of contacts they're adhering to, they are there to assist you to identify gaps. Auditors are not there to make sure you fail an audit. They're there to help you not fail against your food safety program. Second party audit is a better place to be able to share knowledge, but while they can't give confidential information as to how another business operates, they can provide some general information and share their own experiences on how they've seen a similar issue managed in other facilities. So a good auditor is not there to get you. They're there to help you identify potential gaps in your system. If you use an external consultant, then the trick is to actually use them. You are paying for their skills and knowledge. They are there to assist you and not to make life difficult. Listen to what your consultant says and actually implement their suggestions. Don't just trot out your consultant to perform tricks when you have an audit. Another way to overcome inexperience and to put a break on complacency is directly up to you. Attend conferences, join online seminars like this one from the SQFI, sign up to new newsletters or discussion groups such as those you might find on LinkedIn. And whilst for some of these activities may cost money, many of them are free and the only cost is some of your time. Importantly, don't forget to share whatever you've seen or learned with your broader factory teams or better yet, get them to join in with you. In addition to this, one way to broaden your horizons is to actually go out and visit your own suppliers as often as possible, which leads me into the next section on supplier management. Some familiar challenges that we all have with supplier management, for those of us particularly based in Australia and New Zealand, mm -hmm. is the size of the Australian and New Zealand manufacturing industry. 
finding a supplier within that small food industry with the right credentials and finding a supplier who can provide the volume you need at the price you want. And more importantly, obtaining a steady supply or supply chain security, ensuring that your raw materials arrive on time at the volume ordered at the agreed quality and with no substitution unless agreed to. Remember, your business controls your supply management plan. Set your approval criteria and how you manage those suppliers who meet that criteria. And determine what level of risk and level of responsibility your business is willing to take in order to work with that supplier. There's no point in having a supplier approval program that requires certification against a particular standard at a particular frequency if most of your suppliers won't be able to meet that requirement. The only thing this will accomplish is a lot of frustration and a lot of drain on your focus and time. Realistic approval requirements should be based on the business size of your supplier, the risk level and nature of the product they'll be supplying you and the volume of products they will be supplying. Get out there and visit your suppliers. I can't stress that enough. The better you understand their processes and their own challenges, the better place you'll be to determine the approval criteria and how to manage them. Set your criteria, but make it realistic and manageable. And if you need to approve a supplier outside of your usual criteria, make sure you have an alternate management and surveillance process documented and implemented. Visit your suppliers and walk through any relevant production lines and conduct actual annual reviews. Don't just sit at your desk and collect certificates. In addition to this, support your approved supplier program by conducting raw material checks. Don't just blindly accept CFAs. If possible, you should be assessing each delivery of each raw material. The more key to your production a raw material is, the more frequently you should be conducting raw material assessments, at least until you've beat up, built up a decent history of supply. The frequency of your raw material inspection should be based on shelf life of the raw material and the risk nature of that raw material. But don't forget to factor in the relationship you have with your supplier. I strongly suggest you train your warehouse or inwards goods teams to conduct these assessments. It'll give you a break and it will give them some ownership of the process. Don't forget, if your approved supplier program becomes unmanageable for you or meeting your approval criteria is unobtainable for your suppliers, that's a sign that your approval criteria may need to be reviewed and you should be conducting a reassessment of your entire supplier approval program. Remember, it's not set in stone. Good old continuous improvement is the way forward to making your supply management systems a useful tool and an integral part of your food safety strategy. A gradual improvement of your supplies is better than no improvement or facing continual issues with your supplier base. And I'll say it again, get out there and visit your suppliers. So I hope that's been a reminder that there are common food safety challenges across the food and beverage industries and that you're definitely not alone in facing these challenges. And I hope that you've all found some of this information useful. Thank you. Thank you, Marion. There we go, sorry. Thank you, Marion. That was um, fantastic and exactly right on time as well. <laughs> um, um, very interesting presentation, thank you. And um, lots of positive comments in the chat saying thank you. Finally, someone saying it, particularly around getting the uh, managing director on the production floor. I think that seemed to, to um, tick some boxes for quite a few people. So thank you very much. Uh, the quote for Jane Austen, we wanted a reference for that, for a source. <laughs> sense, sense, sense. No, Pride and Prejudice. Right. <laughs> Referencing the food safety program. Um, there was no specific questions um, from the audience, but it re what really reiterated with me is, is um, and you mentioned about Garibaldi Small Goods, 
Uh, I remember looking at that court case at the time when the owner of the business said that um, we stand by a process. We've always done it this way. That was that was early in the piece. That's actually in the court findings, the uh, quote. So, um, yes, excellent. So thank you very much, Marion. Very insightful presentation, some useful tips for a lot of people. So um, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker, again, I'm really proud and happy to, to introduce is Leah Williamson. So Leah is the own brand product compliance manager at Coles. Leah has, uh, again, like all of our guest speakers, extensive experience in food manufacturing and retail. Um, Leah, Leah is going to be talking about food safety priorities in product compliance. So thank you, Leah. Welcome. And over to you. On mute. Thank you, Damien. And hello to everyone. And very honoured to be presenting today, um, especially alongside Damien and Marion. Damien was a big influence Sorry, on my Liam, early career when I was training. For Um, I can hear Leah on my side. 